we need to simplify these, these counts, right? I don't like those sums. So what do you do when you have a sum like that? Gaussian, the, the thing Gauss supposedly discovered when he was one year old or something. <laughs> okay? So that's the formula. The sum of the first k integers, 1 through k, is k times k plus 1 over 2. That's just a good a fact. That it, you, you do well to just tattoo it on your arm. <laughs> so you don't forget. So what is the summation of the first n integers? That's an easy one. N times n plus 1 over 2. Yeah, n times n plus 1 over 2. What about the sum of the first n minus 1 integers? n minus 1 times n over 2. Right, so it's going to be n minus 1, the end of the, of the sequence, times n, which is the next number, divided by 2. Okay? What about the sum of the first n even integers? I, I don't want to tattoo that on my arm. What I want to do is simplify it to the thing that's tattooed on my arm. So what's the trick here? Yeah, just factor, factor out the 2. And then we know how to deal with that inner formula. So it's just 2 times that. So it's n times n plus 1. All right, and what about this, these odd ones here? Some of the odd ones, I can't really factor out a 2. All right, so what I did was I said, okay, I'll add one to each element. And when I add one to each of these elements, what do I get? I get that, right? So I add one to this one, it turns one to two, three to four, five to six. So I get that, and then I got to subtract off those numbers. I, I just added n. I added one to each of the n elements, so I subtract off the n. So I get that. And then we know what that is. Wouldn't okay. it be, I'm sorry, wouldn't mm -hmm. it be 2 times n times n plus 1? Oh, wait, no, it's divided by 2. Never mind, sorry. Okay, so analyzing algorithms, especially ones that involve loops and nested loops, often involves counting. Uh, and, and, and the counting often, often involves ending up with a sum like this. And then when you come up with a sum like this, you've got to have a way of solving it. One thing to notice is, what is the high order term of every one of these summations? N squared, something times N squared. And as it turns out, as I'll argue later, uh, that's really all you need to figure out the high order term. <coughs> so if you've got some sort of sum that looks like the sum of the first N integers, or the first N even integers, or the first N odd integers, or whatever, it's N squared. All right, so back to this. We can now simplify. I just apply those formulas here. And now we've got counts in closed forms of the number of each type of operation that we do. Now we can, we can decide, OK, let's let the running time of the first kind of operation be A, the second type of operation be B, and so on. And we add them all up, gather like terms, and we come up with this formula. So we could, in principle, do this for a selection sort. We can figure out the time each type of operation takes. Um, we end up with C1 being this thing here, C2 being that thing there. And now we've got a formula that predicts the running time of the selection sort on whatever computer I computed the constants on. <laughs> so not a very satisfying way to describe complexity, right? If it's specific to my laptop. We could do it. Now, what we just did was counted operations, timed the operations, and came up with predicted running time. But suppose that you are only interested in the doubling behavior of the algorithm. All you care about is figuring out what happens to the running time when the input time doubles. I want to figure out how much of this formula matters in terms of predicting the doubling behavior. So, let me show you what I'm doing here. This is our formula for the running time of selection sort. 
So think of that as f of n. So what's this here? Right, that's f of 2n. That's, I've just plugged in 2n for everywhere for n. And that gives me, I, here I just simplified it a little bit. So I, I'm done, I'm, I'm, this is the running time for 2n. This is the running time for n. Now, I'm now dividing this by the denominator, and then this by the denominator, and then this by the denominator. So end up with this nasty sum here. So we got that, plus that, plus that. So I'm just doing algebra so far. Nothing mysterious. There it is. But I want to focus your attention on the things highlighted in red. Oh, I say there it is. That's, that's kind of glib. How did I get from what's on the bottom there to what's on the top here? So look at the first term. I got 4 divided by some stuff. Over here I had, uh, I had um, 4 C1 n squared divided by some stuff. Did you see what I did? Yeah. So I divided by C1 n squared. So I divided the numerator by C1 n squared. I divided the denominator by C1 n squared. We just left the 4 up here. And I did similar things down here. I just divided through the, to just did an algebraic transformation. So you, you can just trust me that that's equivalent. <laughs> Assuming I didn't make any type of it. So I've got 4 divided by some stuff. I've got, uh, I've got those things there. So I'm going to highlight some of them in red. You figure out why I highlighted them. What do they all have in common? They go to zero as n goes to infinity. So as n gets large, each of those things in red gets, go, gets closer and closer to zero because we've got constants in the numerator and n's that are n squares and n denominators. Okay? So for small n, it's hard to say what the doubling behavior is. For small n, if we want to talk about the doubling behavior, it's that. For large n, which is what we care about in this business, we just we can treat those things in red as if they're zero, because they become less and less significant as n gets bigger. And if you do that, you just got 4 divided by 1 plus 0 plus 0. So you got 4. So we figured out the doubling behavior. What's that? Does it quadruple? Yeah, they quadruples. You double the size of the array, it quadruples the time it takes to sort. Okay? So all that mattered was a high order term. Now, does that constant even matter? That C1 constant? No. So as far as the doubling behavior is concerned, we just look at the high order term. Okay, let's look at the higher order term. And to compute it, you know, it's going to be C. This is the, uh, the 2 n running time. This is the n running time. We do the division, we get 4. The leading constant doesn't matter. So in the algorithm analysis business, as you probably know, we don't have to laboriously count every kind of operation. We just sort of got to figure out what the most common thing is that happens. And does it happen n squared times or n log n times or n cubed times or whatever. That's as close as we need to get. We just need to figure out the high order term of that nasty formula I gave you. So back to here. This, you know, this thing right here. Actually, not even that thing. This thing right here. All that matters is the fact that it's n squared. The high order term is n squared. So that makes our life a lot easier. We don't need to if you're interested only in doubling behavior, that's all we have to do. So let me end, we'll finish this next time, but let me just end with this slide here. What does it mean? What does it mean when I say something is O of n squared? So when you when you say selection sort is O of n squared, what are you saying? Yeah. Okay. So it's an upper bound. Big O 
is for giving upper bounds on things. Okay? When I say that selection sort is O of n squared, I say it never takes longer, it never takes worse than quadratic time. There's no case that's worse than quadratic. Is it true to say that selection sort is O of n cubed? Yes. Okay? Because all I'm saying when I say selection sort is O of n cubed is there is no case that takes longer than n cubed time. And that's true. Now, saying it's O of n squared is a stronger statement. But it's not incorrect to say it's O of n cubed. Now, having said that, in sort of in normal use, informally, people, when they say something is O of n squared, they usually mean not only is it O of n squared, it's never worse than quadratic, but that, it's actually some case that takes n squared time. Uh, it's often used in that less, less uh, accurate sense. But the way we'll use it is we're going to say a function is O of n squared when its high order term is no bigger than an n squared term. Now, if you know the high order term is no bigger than n squared term, then you know its doubling behavior. It will, at, at most, it will quadruple each time n doubles in the, in the long run for large n. It will, at worst, it will grow no faster than n squared grows. Another way to think about it is n squared's rate of growth is an upper bound on f of n's uh, rate of growth. So big O is for expressing upper bounds on things. Do you know what's used to express lower bounds on things? No, the o, big omega is for lower bounds. Big theta is for when the upper bound and the lower bound are the same. So if, if selection sort is 